thank you so much for joining. Uh, our special guest today is Saad Amiri, uh, who is a Palestinian writer, activist, and architect. She studied architecture at the University of Beirut, the University of Michigan, and the University of Edinburgh, receiving her PhD from the last institution. Amiri has published a wide array of books, including Sharon and My Mother-in-Law, which has been tr translated into nearly 20 languages and was awarded the prestigious 2004 Via Reggio Prize. She's the founder and former director of Riwa, Center of Architectural Conservation, which is, was awarded the very prestigious Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2013. Saad, thank you so much for joining Africa Conversations. So, sure, thanks so much, Mikey. <laughs> really, I'm honored to be on this. So I'd, before I get started with sort of some of the bigger things about you, when somebody looks into your work, they're struck by the fact that you've had these three careers. Yeah. Um, one focus on activism, one focus on architecture, and one focus on writing. How do you manage to sort of thread the, those different strands? Or do you see them as one, one path or three very different paths? Well, so far, Mike, you should say so far I had three lives because I'm yeah, intending to have another two. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, when, my, when I was a kid, my mom used to say, you jump into the ocean, then you ask whether you know how to swim or not. Yeah. Uh, I think my limit of doing something is maximum 10 years. Then I turn around completely and jump into something else. Uh, by pure accident or by intention. So yeah. uh, that's how I ended up with three lives. But really, I am very good in just uh, feeling enough and move, moving on without looking back and being scared. So not being scared of, lo lo of leaving something is the secret to it. Yeah, so this um, helps me just make one quick story that I'd like to tell, is that you not being scared was the first thing I noticed about you. Because you and I met five years or six years ago when you walked into my apartment in Brooklyn in 2015 to attend one of the very first Afrikas unaccompanied. You just wandered in and said, I think this is where I'm supposed to be. And you sat down on the couch <laughs> and completely transformed the evening and very much inspired what the next six years have been. Well, well, How many people Leila. are you inspiring? I mean, like you are, you're the consummate educator. How do you, you know, what is your, who were the early teachers in your life who sort of set that example for you? Uh, okay, my dad is one of them, actually. My dad taught me something I always, always, always repeat. My dad told me, listen, I do what you love. Don't do anything for anybody. Do it because your dad wants it or mom you wants it. Just do it from the heart. And I remember him saying, if you want to go out, they have uh, sell falafel sandwiches. That's exactly what you want to do. Just go out and do it. Uh, I think my dad has influenced me a great deal. It's boring to also my mom because mom was this. Uh, that's what I learned from she. Uh, she did not fear a thing. And third, there was a professor of architecture at uh, B at, uh, AUB um, that I, uh, Professor Khouri, that I liked. He was very out of the box, actually. Um, so these are the people that influenced them, um, you know, about that. I must tell you that I am influenced by, for example, I am influenced by young people. I uh, don't have masters. Uh, every day I could be influenced by a gardener who is very good. So I look around myself and see people. I am influenced by people who are hardworking. Yeah. I think hard work from the heart is what, what guides, basically. Can you um, give a little biographical context? So you spent your early childhood between uh, Amman, most in Amman and Damascus, um, and then you moved to Beirut for um, university. What was that okay, move like? What? Uh, mm. yeah, go ahead. Well, I actually, my dad's from Jaffa, my mom from Damascus. We became refugees. My family came to refugees in 1948, and they lived in Jordan, and I grew up in Jordan. And Jordan at that time was a very little man, was a small town, maybe still a small town. 
And I recall going to, I was so excited to be accepted at the Amman University of Beirut. And I recall when I got to Beirut, really, even though I have seen Beirut as a kid, because my mom, Damascus, we were swimming, uh, going to our aunts in Beirut. But going to Beirut in 1970, Beirut, I think, was its golden age. Uh, it was like the capital of the Arab intellectualism. And it reminded me of going to New York later. Uh, really, Beirut was a very, very, very special place for me. It exposed me to uh, many things. AUB was and still is a great university, but I think also there was a lot of politics uh, at AUB at that time and in Lebanon. Uh, the whole Arab world was there and I always felt Arab and I think that identity of being Arab and meeting Yemenis, Iraqis, Sudanis at the university, but also in Beirut, a sort of uh, uh, affected me tremendously. Tremendously. Yeah. But also Beirut in the 70s was a lot of political and a lot of tension and a lot. Uh, uh, but for me, really, Beirut and AUB, when, when people ask me, where do you graduate from? I always say from the American University of Beirut. Forgive me, University in Michigan, Edinburgh, but I always say from Beirut. <laughs> you know, I heard in an interview that you gave, um, you, you talked about really... F- sort of um, uh, a, a part of your Palestinian identi- identity really matured and sort of yeah. uh, was birthed when you were at AUB. Can you talk a little bit about that and why? And yeah, how, actually it happened a little, bit, a little bit before. Let me say the following, that okay. my, I grew up really in two cities. I always say that the city which had a great influence on, on me was Damascus because my mom's from Damascus. As a child, we used to go to so Al Hamadiyya, Bukdash, Haririya, all the really uh, Damascus leave impact a great impact visually. Uh, Jaffa left an impact completely different. It's the absence of Palestine, the absence of Jaffa, the absence of something mm-hmm. in my life. So I grew up with meeting uh, what Palestine looks like. I had matched in my distance. Uh, so these two cities played a very important role for me as a kid. And I remember for the longest time, actually, even though I knew my father was Palestinian, growing up in Jordan, I thought I was Jordanian. And I must say, my father was not a big nationalist and well, was not so religious. So I, uh, for him, Palestine was a cause rather than a nationality. But I remember very well in 68, when the PLO, whether we like the PLO or not, whether we like Arab or not today, but I have to acknowledge one thing about the PLO. It is the, the organization that made us feel proud that we are Palestinian. And I remember I was maybe 10th grade or 11th grade, and when the teacher came in to ask who is not Jordanian because of fees, something to do with fees, I stood up and she said, what happened to you? I said, I am Palestinian. She said, OK, sit down, sit down. Um, but, but that I remember the day when I stood up and I said, I am Palestinian. That was in 68. Of course, ca- coming to AE, 1917, UB was a big, big... Uh, um, a student revolution, uh, student movement at AUB where we occupied the president office and there was, you know, name it, the Communist Party, the Democratic Front, all the Libyan yeah. parties. So it was very, very enriching. It started, it was triggered in Jordan and then it was nourished in, uh, in uh, Beirut. And I remember in Beirut actually being the student we were asked to go and teach in the refugees' camps in, uh, in Beirut. And I remember going there yeah. to teach them English. And they used to make fun of me. The, the butcher would come and the carpenter would come. And, you know, a little girl, they will always... I remember one, one of them saying, what is fashe? What is fashe in, Engli- in English, which is the lungs? Anyway, mm. it was great time. I flourished in Beirut. That's when yeah. I remember intellectually and politically. So um, I'm very curious about, and, and not only curious, I'm inspired by your decision in 1981 to move to Ramallah. Um, mm, mm, mm. What inspired that decision? Why did you choose um, to make, you know, build a life there? Yeah. Well, I always say my life is a, sequ- a sequence of 
uh, evidence, actually. <laughs> of course, as a Palestinian, Palestine is always part of your think, of your being, of this or that. I think I, I wanted to do a PhD. I want to research on Palestinian village architecture. And I remember very well that I asked a friend from Palestine to me a permit, as you know, as cannot get there. I got a permit to go there for six months to do some field work for my PhD. Hmm. And I went around the village, of also I went around Palestine. It's the first time ever that I go to Palestine. In 82, I did not, Mike, I tell you, I did not know a single person in Palestine. I remember very well arriving to Jerusalem. And my mother thought I was crazy. And of course I'm crazy. My mother said, you know, nobody there. They're going to think of you as a collaborator, Jesus, coming from outside. <laughs> so anyway, I end up going to YMCA. I recall that day, you know, throwing my bag in the hotel and just walking into the old city. Of course, I had images as a child because my dad used to take us to Jerusalem. But I went there not knowing a single person. I remember I rented a car and I still started going around wow. to all villages, cities, and making an archive. God, thank God I still have now at Riwak in 1981. And I said, that's it. That's it. I found my place. And it just happened that I also find uh, my love. <laughs> I yeah. fell in love in Palestine. And I ended up asking Birzeit University to give me a offer teach there. And this is how I ended up staying in Palestine since 1981. But I remember the day when I crossed the bridge. I've never in my life seen an Israeli. Never, never, never. And the permit was in Hebrew. So it was the most dramatic experience you can have. By the time I, I got to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I could not believe it. Uh, so here I am, yeah. uh, the uh, six uh, months um, uh, permit ended up to be 40 years in Palestine. So um, well, there's so much to talk about that I'm going to try to jump from topic to topic because there are yeah, yeah, more questions sure. in the Q&A. So you, by training, your first sort of training, I should say, is as an architect and urban planning. And in 1991, Bilsutfe, you you started Riwa, um, which has now sort of grown into this really amazing, um, impactful institution that focuses not only on preserve, uh, preserving sort of beautiful, prestigious buildings, but more importantly, preserving uh, villages and functional functional architecture and urban planning. Can you sort of talk about the vision for the organization? Yeah, sure. How that vision may have changed over time. Sure. And specifically the yeah, well, village I've, project, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. got that in, in 81, and in the few years I collected, I, I got to know a lot about uh, the villages. I did my PhD on the villages. Uh, so in 91, actually, during the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, I was thinking that Palestine needs something to protect uh, these villages. Mm. Do you have to remember, Mike, that Israelis destroyed 420 Palestinian uh, villages during 48 and 58 uh, and 52. So I felt the need that we need to protect our cultural heritage. And we started with what we call registration. We had, uh, we had registered, we did a national registration to know what what we have, we ended up with three books uh, with 50,000 buildings. We know about 50,000 buildings. Slowly, slowly, we started feeling the need to protect these buildings. So we moved from arriving into protection of single buildings. And we went to the villages. We want to make sure that these are not gentrified areas, meaning that the people who live in the villages are the main beneficiary of those villages. So we started doing cultural centers in these villages. We did almost 130 cultural centers in Palestine in all of the, most of the villages around. And then we realized it's not enough to just make uh, one building in one village. Village. It doesn't leave, a, leave an impact. Eventually, we decided that we want to protect. We cannot protect the 420 villages. We need to protect uh, the most valuable ones, the ones that have a fabric, they have a life in them. So we ended up with something called the, the 50 village project that we started in 2007, and we are still on it. We, need, we started doing the whole village. 
uh, you know, the infrastructure, the community center, playgrounds. We conserve the whole village and we um, um, uh, work it together with the NGOs that exist in that villages. But Mike, what made the project very successful is the following. In, 19, uh, in 2000, thousand uh, Sharon Eric Sharon had decided that they don't want any workers coming into Israel they don't want to hire Arabs they ended up with a big big unemployment one third of the population woke up one day without any job and as a result we at Ruwak started thinking you know we have to think of people rather than of the stone we want to um, create jobs and we did a kind of a shift in our thinking in yeah. conservation that the jobs, the projects were job creation. Uh, we have asked the contractors to hire a lot of workers from the village. We trained the village, uh, villagers, we trained the architects from the village. So really it became more of a community oriented program where they feel that they benefit from it because at the beginning we used to go there and give lectures about history and the importance of cultural heritage and really nobody cared. But the moment they, that their kids, their young men are benefiting from these projects, whether we do a lot of women projects Project, children's project, computers, cinema. Also, we do work with cultural centers in Palestine. Like El Kamenjati, we have created maybe 12 centers, musical centers with all kinds of cult. So I think the secret of it is job creation, but also uh, creating spaces for change. We actually always yeah. do community centers, we do playgrounds, we do spaces where people can meet and talk, but also we do housing, we do housing. We tell people, whatever budget you put, we put uh, equal amounts matching. Uh, so the 50 villages actually have become a big success. So far we have finished almost 20 villages. We still have 30 villages to go. Uh, but uh, I must say it's not an easy work, but it is a very satisfactory work. Yeah. You know, I, I, for me, I find that to be really inspiring, this idea that um, in a previous interview, you mentioned this uh, occupation is really an economic strategy. It's an, um, it's an economic strategy to impoverish Palestinians. And what you're trying to do is to counteract that. And it's not about preserving pretty buildings. It's about preserving economic uh, uh, sort of creating activity jobs, and basically. Preserving yeah, exactly. Which and I think training. Is, yeah, and I don't think that that story is usually told. It's usually when we think about preservation, it's let's uh, maintain pretty buildings as opposed to maintaining the way of life and the way of work. Yeah, um, it's which, very true. Also, as architects, we have always been thinking, you know, architects think about materials, about stones, about design, about we don't think of people, I must yeah. tell you. We are not trained to think of people. We think that we, we, we know. The diff most difficult part of Rewak was also training ourselves to listen to the villagers, what they need, what, how, they, how they do it. Uh, also to convince them, working together with them so they see the difference. You know, when you come to a village and it's almost a gar garbage dump, and then in, in a month, two, six months, they see how it transformed. Uh, now they believe in us. At the beginning, it was very difficult to convince them, but now I can tell you the list of waiting lists that we have from different villages. Actually, now they say, why do you do this village and not our village? Mm. And also, Mike, the other thing is we make them pay up to 20% because sometimes if they get something for free, they don't value it. Not because yeah. we want the 15 or 20%. Uh, percent. What is, before I move on to your writing, um, what has been some of the major challenges that were unexpected that you didn't see coming? Uh, in uh, in, in Rewak's work. Yeah. Uh, mm, the most uh, frustrating thing really is uh, that the national government does not put it as a priority. Mm. You know, in Palestine, we're always under pressure either for education, for health, health education, and the basic, you know, feeding people. Uh, also, the development, new developers, as you know, the private sector is very strong, very strong. And many times the municipalities ally with the private sectors against us. In other mm -hmm. words, the, the all, in all of the Middle East, the historic centers are only built on half percent of the area of the town. 
Uh, so we always argue with them, like build 99% of the Kharabish that you think they are wonderful, you know, high rise and what have you, and leave us this half percent. Yeah. Uh, I find the private sector is the most aggressive and it's very difficult for us to, we haven't so far convinced the private sector that there is an econ economic and cultural potential because people don't look at the long term what it means to preserve these historic cities. Uh, you know, like when you go to Europe or you go to Tunisia, you always look for the historic center to, to yeah. go there. They haven't grasped that, that yet. Uh, the potential of economic, uh, economic development and social development in conservation. Yeah. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about you, right? Um, in 2003, you became an accidental author. Um, and you tell that story better than I could tell, uh, ask you. So could you sort of tell the story of Sharon and mother, my mother-in-law and how you sure. accidentally became a world-renowned author? <laughs> okay, I'll tell you something before that, Mike. I, always, I, I wanted to be many things in my life. You know, I wanted to be, a, a, I love animals, so I wanted to be a vet. I am a, a hakawati. I want to get on the theater. I, uh, you know, I am, uh, my dad that told me uh, you should be a lawyer because the judge will be tired of you and you will win all the cases. <laughs> the one thing in my life that I never thought about was really becoming a writer, partly because I am dyslexic. You know, many of us architects, we go to architecture, we go to art because we are dyslexic and we don't, re we don't read, we only look at photos, basically. Yeah, I am uh, dyslexic so, too. <laughs> you are, huh? <laughs> so you understand. Yeah. Me. Yeah. So really, and I, I did I not think of be, becoming an uh, writer. And it was by pure accident, pure accident, that in 2003, the Israelis reoccupied Allah. And I was living on my own. And I had a, a mother-in-law who was 91 years old, who was as stubborn as I am. She was living on her own. And I ended up uh, bringing my mother-in-law to come and live with me at curfew for 44 days. And it was hell. I must tell you, it was hellish, <laughs> like all the daughter-in-laws and mother-in-laws. Uh, we gave each other hard time, and the Israeli army outside was giving us also hard time bombarding. So what I used to do is a kind of therapy, really writing. I found out writing is exactly like the design. It was a way of uh, therapeutic for me. At the end of the night, when my mother-in-law went to her bed, I sat down and and write a, wrote a story about us, she and I, uh, making fun of the situation. And when we went out, the Israelis let us out. I wrote a, a story, a sad story, actually, about what the Israelis have done to us, about everyday life. But there were emails. I didn't think that, I wasn't thinking of a book. I wasn't thinking of a write, of a reader. And maybe yeah. that was the strength of the book. I ultimately, they got to an Italian friend of mine. She sent them to a publisher, and that publisher sort of liked them. And uh, God knows, you know, I've been working on Palestine for so, so many years. And then all of a sudden, I'm going all over the globe talking about my mother-in-law and Sharon, Sharon and my mother-in-law. And uh, um, that's the one book that sort of uh, made it. And uh, uh, this is how I became a writer. And uh, yeah. another thing, Mike, uh, because I am a Hakawati, I never made the connection between being a Hakawati and a, ri a Riwai or Hikayi. I always thought, being dyslexic, that writing is about grammar, about uh, good language. I wasn't thinking that really writing is about having a good story to tell. And that's yeah, how I became a truth. writer. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that uh, is is true about all of your work it really in, in any one of the work any sort of the, the domain is you don't romanticize things true. and <laughs> i've seen this and um, i feel like i'm the same way and when i was looking at your work i loved it because you're so focused on the life you're not focused on there's no nostalgia there's no romance there's it's it and it's loving it's not romantic but it's loving and yeah is have you always been that way have you have you noticed that about yourself well i can tell you that i am in 
just uh, a lot in the details. Uh, for yeah. example, I am not interested in um, uh, what makes a big cliche in the newspaper or on television. I am not yeah. interested in noble architecture. I can tell you everything I did in architecture is very similar to what I did in writing. There yeah. is a lot of similarity. It's a way of life, of talking ab about... about uh, what all ordinary people, but they are no way ordinary in a way, you know. Yeah. So, for example, in Sharon of my mother-in-law, actually my mother-in-law, whom I made fun of her, was the hero of the book. Yeah. Um, Murad Murad, a, an, a Palestinian worker, uh, is a hero of my book. So I find that there are lots of people that we can learn a lot, a lot, a lot from. And these are the people that interest me. These are the stories that interest me. I am not interested neither in rich people, nor in, in, a, in a president, nor in act, on an actor, you know. Yeah. Uh, I just find that if we pay attention to little details, uh, I love gardening, I love animals. So I find like my pleasure is really in... Uh, if you want to call them mundane things, small is beautiful. Yeah. Well, I guess the reason why I'm asking, and this is a selfish reason, is that I've always said that I live in Beirut, and I've always said that I'm not romantic about Lebanon, but I love it. And, and I... Of course. And I was wondering, looking... Are you romantic about Palestine? No, actually, you know what? Okay, as you said, you're very good. You put it very nicely. You love something, but you don't have to romanticize it, but also you don't have to defend it all the time. Actually, you have to be very critical of the things you love. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, uh, we are doomed if we, um, we talk positively just about... Uh, being a nationality or a city or a religion or, or, or I am totally against this. I think I believe in being a human being, first of all. I think we as human beings have so much to share. And often I feel that religion and nationality and all of what the above make us less human. And then they make us very limited in our thinking. So for me, really, Palestine is a cause, not because it is... Uh, uh, so poverty is a cause, woman is a cause. There are lots of causes in, 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 uh, that I care about. And uh, uh, we have to be critical of the things we love. Otherwise, uh, we will lose it. I couldn't agree more. Um, so I, I, wanna, I want you to tell the story briefly before we move into the quick Q&A about uh, nothing to lose but your life. Um, because uh, I think it's a really powerful story and it's one that I wasn't aware of um, before prepping for this interview. Okay, Mike, I tell you, I'm, I'm very happy about this question because, uh, listen, always you ask the reader, you ask the re reader, what is the book that you read and influenced your life? But you never ask a writer, what is the book that you wrote and influenced mm. your life? And in my case, like, okay, many people like Sharon and my mother-in-law or this or that. But for me, my best, my, the book that I adore is really uh, Nothing to Lose But Your Life, or it's called sometimes Murad Murad. Uh, okay, this is a story about myself accompanying... Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware that many of the Palestinian workers have to gain a living. And unfortunately, West Bank and Gaza, we don't have enough jobs. So people end up going and working in Israel. When the Israelis build the wall, the apartheid wall, almost uh, 150,000 Palestinian workers could not get to their jobs, lost their jobs. And to get to their jobs, they had to walk all night long and sort of sneak into Israel to make a living there. And so I had a, a worker come to work in my garden. His name is Murad. And he told me atrocities about what, how the workers, what they have to go through to get a job in Israel. He described it to me in such a way that I said, oh my God, I live in Ramallah and I consider myself, I know about Palestine. I knew nothing about the life of workers. So what I decided to accompany the workers overnight and see what they go through. So what I did is I wore, uh, I pretended to be a man. I wore my husband's clothes. I put a, I put a hat and I uh, covered myself as much as possible for them to think that I am a man. 
And I went to a village at 11 o'clock at night and I joined 24 workers from one from their village. Uh, they wanted to go to the uh, to Israel, uh, which is if there was a car, normal thing, you could do it in half hour. Actually, we had to walk 18 hours mm. uh, from uh, almost 11 uh, at night. I started until four o'clock in the afternoon. We were 24 workers. Uh, we, uh, they arrested some. They shot at some. By the time we got to the place where they wanted to work, we were only four. I and three others. Three, all the rest were arrested. And it wasn't the only 24. There were hundreds of Palestinian workers that have been arrested. The idea is how hard the Palestinians have to work, how much they have to... Um, their life is threatened. They could be shot. They could be in, put in prison. But at the end of the day, they have to feed their kids. And that trip I did with these workers was really amazing, really amazing. I learned so much of it. And Murad, wow. especially, he's 21 years old, a young man uh, who is hardworking. He symbolizes all um, what Palestinians want in life. Uh, and he had a has a tough life. For me, going 18 hours with these young workers across, walking in the middle of the night, being shot at, we had to run, come back, run, come back, was just amazing, really. It's the most dangerous trip I ever did in my life. I didn't tell anybody before that I wrote the book. But also it was the most um wonderful experience that i ever had in my life learning from these young boys amazing um well yeah you continue to amaze me um i want to jump into the quick q a so that we can get to the questions from everybody um the first question is what are you reading or watching right now Okay, watching. Actually, uh, I have been watching a TV series called Rami. Rami with yeah. a Y at the end. Have you watched yeah. it? No, it? Not only have we watched it, we've had people from the show on the series. Oh, really? Really? Yeah. I liked it. I liked it very much. There were some, uh, some uh, I didn't like so much, uh, but uh, then it got better. It gets sometimes uh, a little bit uh, on the nerve, but I think he's, he's brilliant. Riri Rami is brilliant. That's great. Uh, book, yeah, yeah. Book-wise, I'm reading a Japanese uh, writer. Murakami is his name. Mm. Yeah. And uh, it's the first book, unfortunately. I haven't read him before. And I'm reading, you know, his uh, book called Colorless. It's mm. about coming of age of four young uh, uh, teenagers. And one day they decide, the four of them were very close. And one day, one of them, the, the three of them decide they don't want to talk to him anymore. Okay. And he, he spends all his life trying to figure out that. He's amazing. Mm. He's really amazing. I don't know if you read him. Uh, I haven't haven't read him. I know of him, but I haven't read him. Yeah, yeah, he he's wrote amazing. 1984 and uh, or not yeah. 1984. He wrote another, no, no, uh, Q uh, Q84 something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, absolutely. Okay. Who would you shadow for a day, uh, past or present? Well, okay. Actually, I would like to <laughs> shadow a, a an Italian chef. <laughs> oh, which one? <laughs> Uh, okay, I am terrible with name. His name is Massimo Bottera. Yeah, Bottera yeah, Massimo. Bottera. Massimo. Of course. You he's know the what? one. Yeah, he's, he did, he's the one who did the. Um, uh, he did the uh, Parmesan cheese. Uh, uh, oh, bravo, bravo! Yes, and, this is the one. You know, during yeah. lockdown when I was in Ramallah, yeah. he used to do projects every night. Uh, Mod you know, Modena. Cook, uh, he's from Modena. He's bravo. He's from Modena, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. actually, um, my mom wasn't a great cook, and I haven't been a great cook. So now I'm getting into cooking <laughs> at the age. Okay, I, I <laughs> await your, your cookbook. Yeah, yeah. So this that's him. I'd years. like to spend actually a, a day with him. To learn. Um, okay, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Hmm two things. Yeah. Um, the first thing is about conservation, really. Yeah. Many people who, um, many people think that when you do conservation work that you are against 
development. You are against modernity. You are against... They assume so many things, you know. It frustrates me back in Palestine. It's like, why do you want to keep these ugly little buildings that remind you of poverty and what have you? So I think this, uh, this sort of misunderstanding is uh, sometimes annoy me. The other one, which is different, completely different, is... Uh, Rewak in particular is a collective work. Really, it's a collective work. And um, I don't say it out of modesty, out of reality. I have uh, 15 to 17 architects who go every day in the sun. Uh, you know, in Palestine, it's not easy to move. Uh, they spend hours in the sun, in the checkpoint, and they come back. And what I don't like is people keep saying, uh, you Rewak. You know what I mean? As if it's a shop of mine. And uh, I have left Rewak since 2011. I stopped being the director of Rewak. Part of it to make this point that what is important is to establish an organization. And the success of it, if you leave it and it, ca- it continues to be. Actually, when I left it, it became better even. Uh, so I don't Very like wise. the fact, you know, in the Arab world, it's always personalized. Um, they don't give credit to the people with whom I work. And um, I get frustrated, you know, like if there is a, a, a something, I have to make the phone call. Uh, uh, people, ah, oh, but you invited us, but you didn't call us. So they always assume that it is my mm. personal work. In reality, it's a group work, a collective yeah. work. That's great. That's what they misunderstand about it. Okay. Um, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Well, Mikey Afikra is an inspiration for me. So really, I mean it. I mean it. When I met you in New York, I was like, wow, this is such a great idea. And now, six years later, I am even more impressed than before. Uh, there is another young man uh, called Ahmed Al-Mallak, who is an Iraqi who has started something called uh, Jaiz al uh, in architecture. And I say it not because he gave me the prize at one point. No, not at all. Because he's, he started it when he was 23 years old without oh. any money. And, you know, because at Ruwak, we always wanted to give Jaiz al Ruwak, Ruwak's prize. But we always thought we didn't have money. This guy didn't have money. But he managed to, <laughs> he had the mind and the creativity to make one of the most, now it's becoming a prestigious um, award without money. He started it and, you know, by appreciating people, money is not always the thing. It's a price that has no money in it, but we are all very happy to get it. And last but not least, of course, is Zaha Hadid, uh, the Iraqi um, architect. Not that I am fond of all her works, but I am fond of her persistence. Um, Zaha, the late Zaha, Allah irhamha, she was very adamant. Uh, you know, I knew her as a woman who did sketches. Nobody understood her drawings, actually. And she kept drawing, the, doing these drawings that nobody understood them until a German... Uh, a German uh, Civil engineer understood them and, and, and uh, they did the first uh, building. She spent many years not being an architect. And I like that hard work adamant that she believed yeah. in herself. Of course, being a woman from Iraq adds a lot to it. And unfortunately, the fact that she l- left us also makes, makes her more valuable now. This goes back to your point about how you're attracted to hard work more than anything. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay, so I'm going to open up to the questions because there are uh, many of them. Um, uh, Lutuf? Uh, Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, the difficulties. To what extent was it difficult for you to train people to work with you on preserving the heritage, the Palestinian heritage in the villages? Uh, yeah. seeing that there are economic uh, problems uh, in the area. Yeah. Well, it ha- I can tell you it hasn't been easy, uh, but I think uh, the power of it is I found many people like me who are uh, they found meaning in it, they found a, a, 
uh, adamant that we have to protect our cultural heritage, also having an Israeli enemy who's changing your land every day. There are lots of pluses that make you do work. But I, I can tell you that it hasn't been easy uh, at the beginning. Uh, but slowly, slowly, I think people are convinced municipalities started using these buildings uh, people started telling us they want them for private uh, uses uh, restaurants they i think that we made a dent in people's perception of uh, uh, the use we haven't reached there yet i think uh, we have of, of course difficulty in uh, uh, we don't have any problem with financing so far because we have been successful, but I fear in the coming with, uh, you know, with the difficulties everywhere in this world as COVID, uh, maybe financial, because it's an expensive um, process. Uh, the people are poor, they can't pay much, uh, so we have to raise the funds ourselves. So raising the funds is really not an easy uh, job. Um, but so far, I think working with people slowly, 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 you have to set examples. They have to see with their own eyes how the building was and how it became. And then it becomes a center for their kids or a center for their women. They have to benefit. The world benefit, I want to underline it. Uh, people have to feel that it is their project. I'm going to ask Nia's question uh, very quickly because it looks like she dropped off the call. But she said, um, uh, what is the challenge you meet when you build uh, up the villages and the villages, do the villages still exist today? And when was the last time you were in Ramallah? Well, I was in Ramallah a week ago, <laughs> Less, uh, a week ago. Um, uh, the challenge... Uh, Mike, can you repeat the first part of the question? Sorry. The first was um, broadly, um, what are some of the challenges and do these yeah. villages still exist today? The yeah, yeah. The village, building? okay. Maybe I confused the audience. Uh, the Israelis demolished 420 villages that exist in, in the occupied territories that became Israel. But the 400 and villages that we are working on are on the West Bank. Uh, so yes, they do exist. However, okay. Uh, many of their historic centers are uh, being uh, destroyed by the Palestinians, being destroyed, meaning left to uh, collapse. So what we do, we have something called preventive conservation. We do support the structures so they can last for another 20 years. Uh, so they do exist, yes. Okay, great. Um, Ibrahim, you are up next. Uh, yes, good evening, and uh, thank you, Suad. Uh, my question sure. is selfish. I would like to know uh, the time lag between your uh, your incident when you went with the workers yeah. and you uh, you felt uh, certain things about that 18-hour uh, journey yeah. and the time you to write the book. How long it took you to decide to write the book, and what immediate? Immediately, immediately. You know, it was such a strong impact. There are books that you think about uh, a lot. For example, My Damascus, I spent time. It has been with me for a long time. But this book, actually, I came and I could have told you I started the first night. Really, I was so tired, but I was so touched by these workers. So I did it right away because there was also a lot of conversation with these workers that I wanted to put in. Uh, they have a very different relationship to Palestine than the one I have, uh, you know, because some of the workers told me, you know, you have a salary at the end of the month, you don't have to risk your life because sometimes we sort of uh, uh, idealize, you know, you don't have to work in Israel, you don't have to do this. And he says, you know, if you have six kids, you don't, you know, you have to accept any kind of work uh, you can. He says, and we were shot at and we had to go back and hide. Uh, he told me, I can't go, I can't face my kids without having, uh, you know, a few uh, dollars in my pocket. I simply cannot go home. 
Uh, so you find out how difficult their life is. And then you start, oh my God, you know, like sometimes we academics or intellectuals or uh, uh, do a lot of theories and uh, the people who have to face reality have a complete, complete rea different reality than ours. But immediately I wrote it. Do you advise people mm -hmm. when they have a good idea and emotionally attached to something like this, they should act on it directly or there is timing for different things? Okay, it really depends. It really depends. First, for, for example, in my case, when it is, a, let's say it's a family story that you know and it's with you and you have lived it and it's about your childhood or growing up, I think you could wait, you could wait. Uh, but sometimes there are two books that really force themselves on me. Murad Murad is one of them. And my last book, uh, I have written a book that came only in Italian called The English Suit and the Jewish Cow. And uh, that also was a story that I've heard from a woman in Jaffa. And I just couldn't, uh, I was actually in the middle of writing another book. I left that book and started writing her. Sometimes I get so moved by people's lives. Maybe my life I can wait on, other people's life I cannot wait on. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, sure. Deline, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Hi, Suad. It's a pleasure to see you again. Um, Thank you. I'm in Los Angeles, so this is morning inspiration for me. I love it. Okay. Also, before I get to my question, Vivian Sansur is texting me. I told her I was on this call, and she says, hi to you, and lots of kisses. <laughs> Thank you, both of you. Uh, thanks. Um, okay, so my questions are simple. They are, are you working on any projects now, and how have you been getting through quarantine and this year? Okay, I have just actually, I am uh, in Italy. I ran away uh, from Palestine and miraculously I made it to uh, Italy this week. And the reason I came here is one of my new books that I just mentioned. Uh, actually, I haven't started. I was in the middle of a book that I left for this one, for the English suit. Uh, so I am still uh, under this... Uh, under uh, the shadow of this uh, book. So I, I, I'm not, uh, I don't have quite a project right now. Cool. Writing project. And uh, how have you been handling quarantine these days? Well, actually, I became a great gardener. I always liked gardening. <laughs> uh, my garden, I can send you some photos, guys. My garden was the main beneficiary, and my husband was very happy to see me out of the house. Uh, so I spent it ga doing gardening, really. You should definitely send us photos. <laughs> I will, I will. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Suad. Um, Sure, sure, so sure. Thank you all. So we have more questions. Um, thanks, Deline. We have uh, Anton, and then we have Gaumingu. I think I said your name correctly. Anton Tradal. Hi, Saad. Hi. Uh, by the way, I was at AUB at the same time we were there. Well, uh, do I look that young like you now? Let me no. See. <laughs> also, I met my future wife there. <laughs> ah, great. The AUB is great. Yeah, yeah, it was a re really very formative period, culturally. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was a great time. Uh, my question is related to the conservation education. Sure. Hmm. Uh, is there uh, enough uh, conser education related to conservation in Palestine universities? Is there room for more? What kind of education do you think uh, might be uh, required? Is it? Uh, at the postgraduate level or uh, at the uh, you know undergraduate level is it diploma or is it uh, full degrees what what mm. kind of okay i think uh, i'll start with the second with the last uh, you know what triggered my interest in uh, in uh, conservation was a course i took it at the american university of beirut at the professor raget uh, he did something called uh, lebanese architecture and there is a book called uh, Architecture in Lebanon, uh, Professor Raget. 
And actually, that's where I started my interest. Uh, we used to go to the mountains, to the villages in the mountains and draw houses. Uh, so the undergraduate was what triggered in me. So that's why I say that you need an undergraduate is to let people know. Unfortunately, most of the universities that I went to or also I taught at, uh, at the State University, they don't have enough conservation uh, courses. Uh, but later on, I think you have to specialize. For example, I am one person who did not specialize in conservation in the sense of uh, technical aspects. Uh, but many of the people who joined uh, Rewak later on went uh, to do uh, uh, special courses uh, on theory and preservation and stone and wood and what have you. Uh, so I think an undergraduate course or two courses is necessary. But then one has to do, uh, um, you know, master's degree, I think, uh, on conservation at a higher education. Mm -hmm. Is there something like that now in Palestine? Not really. I mean, we have uh, courses on, indig on Palestinian indigenous architecture, but we don't have a master's or anything like that. The only thing we have students who come and work uh, during the summer uh, in conservation, and they're considered part of their uh, summer school uh, universities. But I don't think we have enough, no. The answer is no. You know, Palestine is full of historical things, uh, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. I also want to say something that we at Rewak are trying very hard to get to Lebanon now. We have a project we are trying to get in touch with uh, uh, Jad Tabit and other people uh, to, uh, to send a few of our architects, even if they are symbolic. Uh, we know that the Lebanese have very good architects and very good conservation architects, but uh, we Palestinians would like to just uh, show a sign of uh, support for what happened in Lebanon. So uh, you might see some of our architects in Beirut. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, we have one last question that I think, if it's okay with you, I'm going to ask on your behalf, just because I'm going to broaden it a little bit. Um, there's questions about where we can find your books in Beirut or in Saudi or in other places. They're translated to, you know, some of them are translated to 20 languages. Um, where can people find your books in general? Okay. Many of them are online, actually, on Amazon. And some of them are ebooks, so it's very easy to get them. Or if you have Amazon services, you can get them. Uh, they are in English and in Arabic. Um, Sharon, my mother in law, is in Arabic. Gold that slept here is in Arabic. Um, Dimashqi, my Damascus. Um, uh, I think I would start with Amazon and have a look at Saad Amiri's book, and then you go from there. Great. Um, so, I thank you so much for doing this. Um, this is a really special episode for me. Um, you've been such an inspiration to me for so long. So, it was really great to have you on. And thank you to everybody who joined. And, Saad, anything less? Any final pieces? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Really, really, yeah. Mike. I can't stress enough how much I am admirer of this uh, idea, Fikra. And I would like to tell the audience that we're going to start a, a chapter in Palestine, in Ramallah. And, uh, no, 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 I need to correct you. We're not going to. Ah. We already started the chapter. We already Ramallah. started yeah, because I left yeah. and I haven't been in following. You know more about it than me no, now. We already right? started. You got the ball rolling. Yeah, yeah. I was so much uh, fond of your work still, and I really think it's great for young people to be connected also that the borders are closed everywhere in the Arab world. I think also to be able to meet one another all over the world is, is absolutely important. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mike. Really, I love you. Thanks so much to everyone who joined. Inshallah, I get to see you soon. Inshallah. Bye. bye, thank everyone. you. Thank you so bye, much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everybody.